11 years ago, a judge sentenced Violet Amaralt and her daughter Cheryl to serve 20 years here. Violet Amaralt's son, Gerald, is serving 40 years in another jail. Prosecutors say the Amaralts, while running a daycare center, photographed four- and five-year-old children naked, raped them, and tortured them. To this day, the Amaralts insist they didn't do it. The ordeal began with an incident that seemed innocuous at the time. A five-year-old boy wet his pants. I had to undress him, wipe his private area, and put a new set of clothes on him. Three months later, the boy told his uncle his private parts had been touched at school. His mother called the state's child abuse hotline. Within a day or two, I was arrested for rape of a child with no investigation done whatsoever. Instead, police and prosecutors ask all the parents of children who attended Fells Acres to come to a meeting. At the meeting, the police said, ask your kids about a magic room, a secret room, and an evil clown. Parents, understandably, were frightened. I mean, every single day, I was in the front page of the newspapers, on television, with, with stories of animal mutilation, uh, robots, you know, clowns. I mean, the allegations were so ridiculous with knives, sticks. They just got more and more bizarre. Daycare centers all over America were investigated and shut down. Plenty of people went to jail. Around the time of the Fells Acres case, there were more than 30 daycare center convictions based almost entirely on children's testimony. Tell us where she touched you. There was no clear evidence of abuse. Despite stories about torture and a 12-inch butcher knife, no child had an injury anyone could document. The state claimed the Amaralds took pornographic photos of the kids, but no pictures were ever found. No adults, teachers or parents who were at the daycare center at all hours ever said they saw anything. What convinced the jury were the words of the children. She put her mouth on my private spot. The children were asked about sexual abuse again and again. They were questioned by police, social workers, psychologists, and of course by their own parents. Prosecutors videotaped some of the interviews. I mean, they were tied up on trees. There was supposedly one of the little boys, the one that was tied to the tree, said there were 16 children that were killed at the school and one, one little girl said she was molested with a, a butcher knife that was like two feet long. It's very, very obvious that nothing with knives ever happened. There was no physical evidence whatsoever of a child even having so much as a scintilla of a cut. The disclosures happened over a long period of time after a multitude of investigators um, got at the hands of the children. The interviewer just kept asking the questions. And coerced them into saying what they wanted to hear. Exactly. Two years ago, I reported on Cornell professor Stephen Cece's research. In his studies with colleague Maggie Brook, you see how suggestible kids are, how quickly they can be led to invent abuse. Brook had this pediatrician add some extra steps to his routine physical examination of preschool kids. He measures the child's wrists with a ribbon. He puts a little label on the child's stomach, and he tickles the child's foot with a stick. Never does the doctor go anywhere near the child's private parts. Then, right after the exam, using an anatomically correct doll, Brooke asks leading questions about the doctor's exam. Can you show me on the doll how Dr. Emmett touched your vagina? No, he didn't on my vagina. He didn't? The child tells the truth. But just a few days later, when Dr. Brock and the child's father again ask about the doctor's visit, it's a different story. Before Brooke has a chance to even bring out the doll, the child shows how the doctor had strangled her with the ribbon. He put, a, he put that around your neck. Like that. It's tight. So tight. And watch what happens when the doll's brought out. She's asked to explain what the doctor did that day. So what did he do? He put a stick in my vagina. He put a stick in your vagina? Yeah. Just like that? Did that? It gets even more violent. No. She claims the doctor hammered the stick into her vagina. Then she shows how the doctor examined her. He looked where? My hiney. He did look in your hiney? Of course, none of it is true. Dr. Brooke found that when dolls were used, half the kids who'd never had their private parts touched claimed the doctor had touched them. 
We hired Dr. C.C. and current associate Helene Hembrook to review the Felsacre's case. These were some really egregious um, interviewing techniques. I was very disturbed, very disturbed. Did anybody touch your bum? No. Mm -hmm. Would you tell me if they did? No. You? I didn't tell me. Would you tell Bert? They didn't touch me, Bert. And the child is repeatedly saying no. I, I can't even count how many times this child said no. And how many times the question was re-asked and redirected and the child's given answers were uh, uh, seemingly not sufficient. Children who said they'd been molested were praised. And remember, these kids were interviewed again and again, sometimes more than a dozen times. The researchers say repeated interviews alone encourage children to make things up. A bum. A bum. That's right. I disagree. I don't think children are suggestible to that extent. Uh, Lawrence Hardoon, the prosecutor at the time, says he's not troubled by the interviews. Kids don't make things up that relate to sexual abuse. What do you mean kids don't make this, these things up? You're familiar with CeCe's research? Get the, the girl pounding the stick into the doll? I mean... That's sexual abuse. You I keep asking the kids, they come up with stuff like that. When I started doing this research, and certainly in 1984 when this trial was being conducted, I think I would have shared skepticism. In 1995, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your orientation, there's now amassed a considerable body of scientific knowledge that says that you're increasing the odds of getting false assents by using these techniques, knowledge we didn't have 11 years ago. The jury came back and they came into the courtroom and they, they convicted me on every single charge. I heard my wife scream and my family scream. And it was a tough thing. It was the toughest thing I'll ever, ever have to deal with in my life. One year later, Violet and Cheryl were convicted. Gerald Amaral's daughter, Katie, spoke at the sentencing. I know my grandmother and I didn't hurt any of my friends at Phil's Acres. Daddy didn't either. <laughs> Thank you. Personalize the middle part. Gerald's wife, Patty, has stood by him, devoting countless hours to a campaign to overturn the verdict. She has plenty of help. More than 100 supporters assembled at a hall near the former Fells Acres daycare center. They include former staff members, parents who sent their kids to the Amaralts, some of the kids who attended, now they're teenagers. All say the Amaralts are innocent. He is the best father, the nicest guy, everyone's friend. He's, he's no sex abuser. So what happened here? What? They were all, all out for the money, and I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> Twenty families involved in the case did receive an insurance settlement of almost $16 million. But most people here say this isn't about money. It's about the hysteria that swept the country in the 80s. About crusading prosecutors. Its significance extends well beyond the four walls of this courtroom. And about ignorance of what some children will say if asked certain questions often enough. I don't believe that I should sit here and die in this prison. It should not ever have happened. It's not true. Last Thursday, Violet and Cheryl Amaralt were summoned into a court, and an appeals court judge announced that based on a legal technicality, he was overturning their convictions. One more hour, or even one more minute, in custody on this case would be improper. A few words and everything was different. Violet Amaral walked out into the sunshine, free for the first time after eight years.